you can be um, involved quite deep in religion, in Christianity and Judaism. And both beautiful, no problem. But if the Holy Spirit's not there, both, both are pretty dead. There's no life in them. The, the, the Holy Spirit is like a spiritual defibrillator. It's like, poof, clear, bang, and it, and it gives you life, you know? And fuses life. Religiosity in any form it takes is lifeless and it's legalistic. Um, can't go anywhere without the Holy Spirit, though. Yeshua said the last thing he said to the boys before he ascended, don't go anywhere. Until you get that spirit, you can't do anything without it. And it's so true, isn't it? It's the very spirit of the living God that tabernacles in us. His holiness, his love, his spirit lives in us. We've got to be very receptive to the Spirit because you can attract the Spirit and you can also do things that will push him away. And we want to attract the Spirit, don't we? And what I can tell you on the feast days, the Lord turns up. He turns up for sure. Well, these things might be new to some of you. And you might not be aware. But if you're celebrating with the right heart, not in legalistic perversion, in a spirit of purity, a spirit of truth, a spirit definitely of love, he shows Okay, so that, that's the premise. That, that should be your mindset. Fair? Yeah. So that's where we're going to attack it from. Now, let's see where we're at. Leviticus 23. Adonai said to Moshe, you, you want to hear God speak? Read Leviticus. Because all the way through it, Adonai says, Adonai says, Adonai says. And you, know, and you get brought up in Christianity to think, well, it's this legalistic, priestly, bloody book that you don't going to hear. And it's got some of the most fascinating and um, incredible things in it as a book. Leviticus 23 being one of those chapters that you absolutely need to be aware of and learn and love. You know why? It's got Yeshua all through it. Adonai said to Moshe, tell the people the designated times of Adonai, of, of who? Does it, does it not say the de designated times of the Jewish people? Does it say the designated times of the Jewish people only to be celebrated till Yeshua comes? No. So we're going to shake that one off, right? Come. Adonai, right? There is, then. Fair? Is that a fair comment? Yeah. Feast of Adonai. No problem. Which you are to proclaim as holy convocations and are my designated times. He's picked the time. He's told us to do this. This is a holy convocation. Where you make an effort, you get dressed up, you come to synagogue, and you have some time with your fellowship. Tell the people of Israel, in the seventh month, the first of the month is to be for you a day of complete rest. So it's a, a Shabbat, right? Now, Today is Shabbat, and the first of Tishrei has fell on Shabbat, but it could, it could land on a Wednesday. But that would be a Shabbat for you. That would be a holy day. 
if you live in messianic Judaism as a lifestyle, that'd be a day you'd want to book off, wouldn't it? And if you're going to follow the face, that being said, 28th of September, Yom Kippur, we're going to be here doing this, doing this. It's a Monday. It's actually a public holiday. So we've been lucky this year. But today is the first of the seventh month on the Hebrew lunar calendar. God's calendar. First of Tishrei. Yeah? Everybody cool with that? A complete rest. Be aware for remembering. Key word. A holy convocation announced with blasts on a shofar. Um, do not do any kind of ordinary work. Ordinary work. Ordinary work. What do you do for an ordinary job? Gav, Gav's a financial manager, so you're not going to do that today, are you? Because that's your ordinary work. Bring an offering made by fire. Well, that was an agricultural setting. We're bringing our gifts and our love and our offerings and whatever, aren't we? In spirit. There's the kicker. In spirit. Now, we know from these, there's only 44 sentences. And I've, and I've, and I've banged it like a drum verbatim for yonks. That it's the whole plan of salvation. The whole plan of salvation. You get it? Leviticus 23, this obscure little chapter that's probably the most powerful chapter in the whole Bible. And it's hidden away. And most of the church just goes, it's Jewish stuff, don't they? Give me strength. Um, it's the whole plan of salvation. And they are the Lord's designated times. His. We established that last week. The whole plan of salvation. His return, his restoration. You don't see it anywhere else in the Bible. In its fullness, as a literal blueprint it's a literal blueprint of salvation people of Israel there'll always be an identifiable remnant of Jewish people got to get your head around that one because God made a promise that's why and he's bringing them back because he said he would I'm going to disperse you throughout all the world but there'll be a time when I'll bring you home. 700 scriptures. It's not just a flash in the pan. It's not just two. 700. I'll bring you back. I'll bring you home. That's the Jewish nation. And it's right there. Right in front of your face. And he's doing it today. He's bringing them back. Today. And we are grafted in. If, you, if you're not Jewish, you're grafted in through the blood of Yeshua. That Romans 11, it's Bible 101, Christianity 101, really. That's another one that gets overlooked. So we've got this movement, this messianic Jewish movement, because it proves that Adonai did not forget his people. I mean, it's been taught for millennia that he's, he's done away with them, hasn't it? He's done away with the Jews. Jacob's trouble, that's for them. It's nothing to do with us. That's the Old Testament. And it, that, that's what you get in, in the body, isn't it? To, to be fair, I'm not, not attacking, but that's what you get. Is that fair? Fair comment? He's forgot about his people because it's us now. We've replaced them. Replacement theology, it's rife, absolutely rife. He's give it to the Gentiles. Well,
the Muslims think that the Gentiles blew it as well. And he gave it to them. Or at least that's what some teach. So again, replacement theology. The other problem is that the Muslims wouldn't know the God of the Bible if they fell over him. Sorry, Brian Houston, but there you go. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and what they call Allah, isn't the same God. He's not. Where we are at is, when you see Messianic Jews, and you've seen a lot since 1967, since Jerusalem came back into the hands of the Jewish nation, this movement's been bubbling up and getting more and more. And now it's getting pretty popular, isn't it? There was a time there was no Messianic congregations in Israel, now there's about 150. We've got a congregation over there, by the way. But it burst, it, it re, it's like a rebirth. It's not really a denomination. It's like, it's like a rebirth of the first century movement. And it's been purposely done by the Lord. Why? Well, they're a testament to what God did and said. And when you see him say, Baruch Ababa Shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Guess who's going to come? Because they've got to say it. Yeshua said that, didn't he? I'm not coming back till you say, Baruch Ababa Shem Adonai. And guess what? Now they're saying it. Now they're saying it. They are a living proof that God is good, God is faithful, and he fulfills his promises. He said he'll never leave them or forsake them. And it says in Jeremiah 31, he's going to renew the heart. And every time a Jewish person says it, it's one soul closer to Yeshua coming back. It's nothing that they've done. It's just the Lord bringing about his plan. It's in your Bible. That is your Bible. This movement was started by God. He's on the move. The remnant is the messianic community. It is. We've got a biblical mandate as, as a Gentile. If you're Gentile, you've got a biblical mandate to provoke the Jewish people to jealousy. Why do you think we're here? How do you think that happened? Messianic congregation smack bang in the middle of a Jewish community. How did that happen? Tell me how that happened. Because I'm still trying to figure it out three years down the line. Yeah, they probably are. Yeah, they probably are. <laughs> how, how, how can the Orthodox be their remnant? How? Tell me how. They don't know Yeshua. How can they be Yeshua's remnant? They will. Not until he comes. But he's on the move more and more. And time's getting short. The messianic community is the head. It says ten Gentiles will grab the tits of a Jew and say, show me your God. That's not going to be the orthodoxy, is it? It's not the orthodoxy. It's a time to come. It's in the millennium. A time of peace and joy, gladness. Zechariah 8.23, if you want the reference. And he's with us at that point. 
We used to be known as a cult. <laughs> Certain sections of Perth still say that. <laughs> there you go. Well, it's a different story. But we've got to start somewhere, so we'll start here. Um, 23-25. Remembering, remembering. We spoke last week about a time uh, about being grafted in. One new man, right? Your faith didn't start in Wittenberg. It didn't start in Rome. It started 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem. And you are grafted in to the commonwealth of Israel, whether you know it or not. Do you have to be Jewish? No. No. Anybody who teaches you so is teaching you wrong. It's not about being Jewish. It's about being Godish. It's got nothing to do with salvation. It's got nothing to do with legalism. You are saved by grace. You are sanctified. You are made holy by the word. Right? Who's the word? The commandments. If you love me, you will obey me. We established entole, the, the Greek word for commands. When he's saying, if, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. Entole is the same commands. It's the Mosaic commands. You don't have to take on his word for it. Be a Berean. Look it up. Entole. It's the Mosaic law. It's the same. It's got to be the same because if they're not the same, you can't be one. Me and the Father are one, right? One can't be two. You can't have different rules. And the same goes in here. You can't have different rules. But it's about spirit. It's not about physicality. I had somebody giving me some jip this week. You've got to be physically circumcised. No, you don't. Read your Bible. This has got to be circumcised. This, your heart, 100%. If anything else, you're off. And I know these people teaching that here. Not here, but in Perth, absolutely. And they're off. Because the, you've got to take the Bible as a whole. It's a universe. You've got to take all the Bible because it's all Torah. Circumcision's neither here nor there. Who said that? It's about this, isn't it? This is the new covenant. So you've got to overlay the new covenant over all the Torah and infuse Yeshua through it. And then you get a different ball game. Then you get it then, it, then it's real. Then it's true. Does that make sense? Spirit and in truth under the new covenant ratified in the blood of the king, circumcision of the heart, being born again, being immersed in Yeshua, and now receiving the Holy Spirit, which he could never do before. Overlaid on the old, it overrides the old, no sacrificial, no sacrificial system. That's what's going on. These laws about sacrifice, it wipes about, about 300 out of the 613. And then you've got laws for women, laws for men, laws for priests, laws for the temple. What are you going to do with all them? What about the 1,056 commandments you've got in the New Testament? What are you going to do with them? How are you going to know about them through this? Because he's going to download into this. Arnie, do this. Arnie, go there. Arnie, say that. And the same for every one of you. Because we've all got access to it. You've got, you've got access to the throne room of heaven. Direct access. How much access you get depends on you, doesn't it? 
What does it depend on? How close you want to be, doesn't it? And how obedient you are. God is love, but God is holy. The key to God's heart is love, but obedience turns that key. That's your Bible. We've got a great and high priest now, the Melek Zadik, Melchizedek, Melek, King, Zadik, righteous, the righteous one. There's only one. And you'll see him in Genesis 14, you'll see him in Psalm 110, and you see him all over Hebrews. Why all over Hebrews? Because they were Messianic Jews, and they're thinking, hang on a minute, Yeshua's from Judah, isn't he? How can he be the high priest? Because he's in the order of Melech, Zadik, that's why. And it overrides the old order, overrides it. You've got to overlay that over the old. Does that make sense? You've got to walk in the truth of the Lord and mature and you've got to grow. It's the first of Tishrei. Don't do any ordinary work. So it's a double whammy today. It's a high holy day today. And it says complete rest for remembering. It's a word that's used some 160 some times. That word zakhar. Remember, to recall, to remind. It's plural zikhar note. To remember, to recall, to remind, to mention. But to remember what? You could be remembering any number of things, like deliverance or your salvation. Any number. It's not necessarily wrong or bad. You could be giving thanks and praise in the midst of it all. But then you, you put in a, an interpretation in. It's not an inter. I'm sorry. It's not. That's not the interpretation. It's application of what God's saying. Remember those things, maybe. Maybe there's something else. So what do we do? We need to poke around in the Word a little bit, don't we? Let's find something we should remember. What about that? Deuteronomy 5.15, you are to remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. And I don't know, your God brought you out of there with a strong hand and an outstretched arm. So remember where you come from. Because you all came out of Egypt. All he's doing now is getting Egypt out of you. Mitzrayim, darkness. We've all come out of the darkness of the world, right? And he found you. You didn't find God, he found you. You didn't save yourself. You can't come out on granny's apron strings. Adonai brought you out, it was him. He delivered, he found you. And he should get the glory. Because he's God. He's not your mate, he's not your homie. He's not the big man upstairs. He's the almighty, creator and sustainer of the universe. Remember who you come before. And he came with an outstretched arm and he battered all the pagan gods in his way. And he said, no, nope, they're coming with me. What are you going to do about it?
Therefore, Adonai, your God, has ordered you to keep Shabbat. And you, you, you've got to deal with that. Because it changes things. It costs you a lot. It could cost you your congregation. That Christianity reconsidered. Has, has anybody read that yet? What do you think, Jen? It's good, isn't it? Makes you think, doesn't it? He put it all on the line, didn't he? Cost him, it cost him everything. It can cost you your family. But the benefit outweighs the cost. You've got to put God before the traditions of man now. Shabbat is very, very special. It was given as a sign the people of Israel are to keep the Shabbat, to observe Shabbat throughout all the generations as a same meaning as perpetual then. You, you can look perpetual up in the Greek, in the Hebrew, whatever language you're comfortable with. It still means the same thing. It still means forever. It's a sign between me and the people of Israel, which you are grafted into. It's the fourth commandment. Four is the number of creation. The first four commandments are how you are supposed to love the Lord your God. Four. Why? Because he created. So when you're here, you're literally punching Satan in the eye and saying, my God created, and there's nothing you can do about it. You are saying you are the creator and the sustainer of the universe. And you created in six days and you rested on the seventh. It's an acknowledgement. It's a sign. It's like getting married. Deuteronomy 15, 15. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and Adonai God redeemed you. That's why I'm giving you the order. Remember you were a slave. I don't know your God, he redeemed you, which is a different word to delivered. He delivered you and me out of Egypt from the enemy and death, from your sin and your guilt. But he took them and the Egyptians that came after him didn't he? They all come after him and he put them between a rock and a hard place, didn't he? And they're all going, oh no, what are we going to do? And he said, just calm down, watch this, didn't he? And boom. I'm going to redeem you. He's brought them out of it. No problem. They're delivered now. They're out of it. But then he redeemed them. The enemy they saw, they will never see again. Meaning the enemy can't take you back. That's being redeemed. You've been paid for. And it was a really, really heavy price. Priceless price. But you signed, you sealed, and you delivered, and the ransom was paid. That's something to shout for joy about. Hmm? I don't know, your God redeemed you. That's why I'm giving you this order today. If you read through to find out about the order in context, you'll see he was telling telling him things like don't don't glean your crops. To the corners, leave them for the less fortunate. Because remember, you was a slave once. But now you've got abundance. Remember where you came from. 
remember, you've got to be a channel of God's blessing, not a terminal. You'll find the more blessing you give, the more you'll get. Not financial. More of the Holy Spirit, more of the presence of God. That's where you should be. Deuteronomy 16. Remember that you were a slave in Egypt. That you'll keep and obey these laws. The new covenant doesn't change this. But we're not under the law, are we? We're covered by the blood and delivered from sin and death. Now I can do what I want. Really? If you love me, you'll obey my commands. Same commands, interlay. And he's a cult leader. He's dragging them under the law. <laughs> Please grow up. Please read your Bible. Please go up and look some words up. Because one word will change your theology. I'll tell you that for nothing. One word. Whole theology. Whole theology. You and the father of one, Adonai Achaz. You can't have different teaching. And be a chad. Yeshua is the Torah made flesh. But now the Spirit lives in us, inside us, in our hearts, not on tablets of stone, on tablets of hearts, right? He's made us workers of a new covenant, the essence of which is not the written text but the Spirit, which gives life. Shaul said that. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. This is your Bible. It's his theology. It's the Lord's theology. Remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and I know your God redeemed you from there. This is why I'm ordering you to do this. What's this? No, don't exploit the poor and the needy. You were there once. Don't do that. Look to walk with justice. Remember. God's telling us today, Yom Teruah, to remember. Don't ever forget where you've come from. It was J. Hudson, J. Hudson Taylor who said, don't ever let me be more than three feet from the cross. So you should never forget what Yeshua went through and that price was paid was priceless. The priceless price paid by the causeless cause. You want to get married today, it's going to cost you. It's going to be expensive. But we're invited to a wedding. Are you going to put a price on that? Can't forget where we've come from, not for one day. And people will say, well, we should hear the trumpet every day, Annie. Yes, you should. Yes, you should. Well, these feast days, they're different because they're corporate. They're corporate. We should be hearing on an individual level, yes, you should, but corporately, these days are special. Why? Because we can't get together every day, can we? So what I calls us out corporately to remember a holy convocation. This is holy, a holy convocation to Adonai, sacred to Adonai. So it should be sacred to us. 
Is, any, is anything sacred anymore? Where are we at when you can rip a baby out of the womb at nine months? That's not sacred, is it? Well, it so should be, shouldn't it? Where's the church? Who's standing up? Where's the church? There should be more than 1,500 people at an abortion rally at Parliament, shouldn't they? How many, how many Christians in Perth? More than 1,500. You can rip a baby out of the womb at nine months now, and that's okay. Sacred. But you've got to be cool today. It's all got to be trendy and top knots and tats and all blacked out and smoke machines and let's go have a nice time. Let's not get convicted. I don't want that. And it makes me feel bad. <laughs> Welcome to Beth Yeshua. That's my job. No, it's not cool. And no, I don't care. I don't want to fit into the world. That's what the world wants, isn't it? It wants us to be lukewarm. It wants us to be trendy. It wants us to be comfortable around full-term abortion. That'll be the day. It wants us to be comfortable around the world. They don't want the presence of God. And we've stopped bringing it because we're compromised. Because we've got to fit in. And we've got to attract people in. Bums on seats because you've got to pay the mortgage. And you've got to pay the wages and you've got to pay for the programs. So now it's a business. I wonder how many have fell over in the COVID. Lost our way, becoming so seeker friendly. And now he can't tell the difference between us and the world. You've got to be where the Lord is, and if we're not, he's, he's, he's going to, he can test you. He'll test you, not for his benefit, but for yours. You don't know what's in somebody till you get squeezed. Yeah. He does it for us. See if we've got any chinks in the armour. See where we should be and where we're not. Are we a little bit off? Are we a lot out? Could we be better protected? Could we receive more blessing? He does it because he disciplines us, because he loves us. So his commands, his laws, his love, they are ways of pleasantness, they are ways of peace, and they are to keep the enemy out. Keep the enemy away from ruining your family, ruining a ministry, ruining your reputation. Whatever it might be. He guards us and he guides us. So we've got a holy convocation, set apart assembly, announced with the shofar blast, right? A turu ah. It's a signal, an alarm of war, or a shout of joy. So it's Yom Teru, a day of the blast of the shofar. It means signal, alarm, shout. Now, God just doesn't wait for today to send us a shofar alarm. He can and he does regularly, but like I said, it's a corporate day today to hear that trumpet together and try and recognize what God wants as a congregation. 
what does he want as a hole in the body corporately? But it is an alarm. It could be a shout of joy too. We could be very close to the Lord. We could be very humble, very broken, very contrite before the Lord, hungry, desperate, thankful. So to you, this, this season might just be a blast, you know? A blast of joy and good on you. It can be a, a blast of joy for anybody who hears it and turns, turn, shuv, turn, te shuva, make the turn and come back. Because, you know, you, you've, you've gone a bit whoo, like that, you've skewiffed and you've gone off. And you hear the trumpet, you go, oh, whoa. And you come back, you turn. Tissue there. That makes your daddy really happy. The signal is prophetic in nature. In the Bible, Shofar's always used for the coronation of kings. And they'd blow the shofar over the king to coronate him. But when the king of the kings comes, that's going to be a special blast. That one's from heaven, like Matthew 24 says. And you see it in the prophets as well. Go figure. Isaiah, he was a prophet. On that day, what day? No. When a great shofar will sound. Those lost in the land of Asher will come. Those scattered throughout the land of Egypt, they'll worship Adonai on the holy mountain in Jerusalem. The great shofar. says it in Zechariah. Adonai will appear over him. His arrow will flash like lightning. Adonai Elohim will blow the shofar and go out in the whirlwinds of the south. And his angels will gather the saints. As it says in Matthew 24, that shofar blast. It's Adonai Elohim, the father, blowing the shofar for the bridegroom. That's how it rolled, isn't it? And the go is Jewish idiomatic. It's um, so the bride goes. The bridegroom goes to the bride with a hin of wine, and he pours the wine and he gives it to his girl, and he says, "I'll love you forever." And he's asking her to marry him. She's under no obligation. But if she takes the hit and she drinks it, she's saying, I'll love you too. Then he goes back to his father's house and he builds an extension for him. But it's only when the father says, son, now it's time. Let's go and get her. And they come back with a great entourage for the bride. Does that sound familiar? It's the father that blows it. So tell the people of Israel. My appointed times. There's always going to be someone who says, I, I, don't, I don't need this. I don't have to do the feast. I can hear the shofar every day. And I've got to say, you so do. Yes, you do. But do you? Because it might be getting drowned out by all that vitamin I supplement that you're taking. 
Just saying. I, 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 I. Well, they're his feasts. You are his, so they are yours. If you love him, you'll see it because you'll see him in them. And it's about celebrating them and enjoying them. That's fair, isn't it? So what's all this Rosh Hashanah about? Where did that come from? Jewish stuff, right? <laughs> okay. Exodus 12. I don't know, I said to Moshe and Aaron in the land of Egypt, he said, you're to begin your calendar with this month. It will be the first month of the year for you because you're leaving. This is the month of Aviv, right? Which was when the Passover was. So that's like the first month of the year. So you'd think, well, that should be New Year, right? But it's not. which Aviv's March, April, our time, on the Roman calendar. Well, this is lunar, this is God's, this is biblical. Working on the moon. So Aviv's the first month when they were redeemed, Passover, spring. So where does Rosh Hashanah come from? What does it mean? Rosh Hashanah. It means head of the year. And it coincides with Yom Teruah. That, that'd be an apparent discrepancy in your Bible, wouldn't it? Can we reconcile it? Of course we can. It says in Leviticus 23, 24, tell the people in the seventh month, the first of the month, today, is to be a day of complete rest, remembering holy convocation, announced with the blast on the shofar, right? So cool. Here's where we are. So what's this head of the year about? Well, they recognized that the autumn feast in Israel, springtime for us, where it's a time of spiritual newness, a time to hear the shofar, a time to take stock, and reflect where you are with the Lord. Be introspective. So people do think, well, I can do that all the time. And I keep saying that, but it's true because they do. But not exactly. God's got times. We, we don't celebrate our wedding anniversary every day or your birthday, do you? So we've got to celebrate God's days when he says, not every day. There's a spiritual connotation to that, but like I said, it's got to be corporate. This is what God wants us to do. It's his calendar. These are what's known as the days of awe. It's Yomim Norim, 10 days. And the 10 days between Yom Teruah and Yom Kippur you're supposed to spend these days reflecting. Not just a couple of minutes in the morning with a quick devotional and a coffee and out the door you go. You're supposed to take some time. Examine yourself. Ask the Lord to examine you and find out where you are with him. Is that legalistic? Why is it legalistic? Legalism isn't what you do, it's the reason you do it, isn't it? Is it Jewish stuff? Why is it Jewish stuff? You want to know where you are with the Lord, don't you? Am I holding something back from him? Am I keeping some of the, the rooms in my tabernacle locked up? that he's got no access to. Do 
Do we need to stop doing something? Is there something, something hindering his presence in my life? And do you know what you're doing when you do that? You're asking, you're seeking, and you're knocking. Yeshua said, if you ask, you'll be answered. If you seek, you'll find, didn't he? If you knock on the door, it'll be open. So it's not about doing the feast to feel like you're more Jewish. The right heart with the right information is very, very powerful. Not trying to prove to your Christian friends that you know more. Come on, man. That's my best Joe Biden. Come on, man. <laughs> Come on, man. When Jews become messianic and they do the feast, they see something different in them. What do they see? They see Yeshua. And now they see that they're alive. If you go to a, a pure Jewish Passover and then you come to ours, I'm telling you, you'll see a difference, won't you? Because they're just mechanical to them. It's like, yeah, we've got to do it. And it's Passover. So it's like what they do. It's just, it's them, isn't it? It's what we do. And then we've got the Cookaboo Central Crazy Town coming in from Gentile 101 and giving it the biddy biddy bums, thinking that they're biological Jews. Flag waving and shofar blowing with the fiddler on the roof. And it's not about being Jewish, it's about being Godish. You've got to figure that out. You've got to figure out these are for you. If you are his, they are yours. Nobody's forcing your arm up your back. And certainly not the Lord. Who, who likes obligatory love? Why would he do that? You've got to do it. Why would you why would you want to do that? Why would he want to do that? Obedience is the key to God's heart. The heart is his heart is the Torah. But I told you it's love that turns the key. Everything you do has got to be underwritten in love. Everything. Are you missing it? You're just missing it. So it's a time to reflect, it's a time for introspection, a time to take stock, a spiritual new year. It's time when God asks the age-old question he's been asking from the start. Where are you, man? Where are you? Adam went from being lit up with all the glory of the Lord, to being full of shame and nervous and anxious and scared and full of guilt, didn't he? Oppressed and depressed, trying to hide from his daddy. His daddy knew exactly where he was. And he said to him the same thing, what happened, man? Where are you? What happened to us? You can have so much more, Adam. You could have had. What have you done? He's still asking us the same, isn't he? On Yom Teruah, he's saying, where are you, man? You can see this in your Bible. There's a celebration of Yom Teruah, an actual celebration, and it's actually in Nehemiah. The time when Zerubbabel was the, was the governor of the province, he went back from Babylon after the exile. 
And there was only about 5% of the Jewish people who returned after that exile. After the destruction of the first temple. Well, that's when you see in Esther, there's still a big population in Babylon. Why didn't they return? Probably the same reasons as today. Because life's good. Why, why would you want, want to leave a place where you, your home's beautiful, you've got a good business, your kids are in the best schools, beautiful scene at any number of reasons. What do you want to go back to Israel for? War-torn, battered, poverty-stricken. What you see on the, you know, on the coaches when you go on tour, that's not, not Israel. It's very, very, very expensive. There's a lot of poverty there. Got to choose your schools carefully because you've got to watch how many Katusha rockets are coming over. Why would you want to go there? Wasn't much different back in Esther's time neither, minus the rockets probably. Same kind of deal though. 458 BC, Ezra, Ezra first, and then 444 Nehemiah. Gets sent back by Cyrus. The walls are in a mess, so he's got to rebuild them and put them back together. And then he starts to put the people back together, spiritually. And that's where we're at at this point, chapter 8. The seventh month arrived when the people of Israel had resettled in the towns. All the people gathered with one accord in the open space in front of the water gate and asked Ezra, the Torah teacher, to bring the scroll of the Torah of Moshe, which Adonai has commanded Israel. Ezra, the Kohen, brought the Torah before the assembly, which consisted of men, women, and all children, old enough to understand. It was the first day of the seventh month. Facing the open space in front of the water gate, he read, for, he read it from, to the men, the women, and the children, who could understand from early morning until noon. And all the people listened attentively to the scroll of the Torah. <laughs> so it's the seventh month, it's the first day. All the people are settled now. And you, you, if you just read that and you weren't aware of the feast, you'd just wash over it, wouldn't you? You thought it was seven months, the first day of seven months, so what? Wouldn't you? But now you know. Nothing's insignificant. God's put it in there. So we can't, in all fairness, ignore it. Obviously, it's got its meaning. Seventh one, Tishrei. So they're all gathered at the water gate. It's on the east side, towards the Temple Mount. Loads of gates around the city. Ezra brings out the Torah scroll of Moshe, which is foundational to us. And bibliographically, what you read in your Old Testament today, I'm telling you, is pretty much the same thing that he was reading then. That's how accurate your Bible is. Ezra the Kohen brings the Torah before all the men, women, and children, old enough to understand, and he's telling them, Don't, don't underestimate your kids. He's got kids there from early morning, like sun up till noon. You all think you've got it bad with me. But they could have been five year old and they would have known the book of Leviticus cold. Five years old. Don't underestimate your kids. The first day of the seventh month, Yom Teruah. And he's sending a message right here. Nehemiah was really being the shofar for God. The prophets were shofars. Yeshua was the shofar. And 
And people do complain, oh, I can't stay that long. Oh, you know, I get I get achy and well, you know, you'll go and watch a film for two hours, won't you? You can't sit here and listen to the word. There's plenty of places you can go and, you know, go tomorrow, spend the, in and out in an hour, sing for 40 minutes, you'll get a 15-minute flyby, fill in the blank, and it's like, show me the money and see you later. It's not what we do. Go away with a flag somewhere. He's using Nehemiah because he wants people to come back, not just to the land, but to him. There's no point in all the Jews going back to the land if they're not going to know the Lord, is there? So we've got a job to do here, don't we? And provoke them, Tom. We've provoked them, all right. Not in the right way. Locking women and children up in a synagogue and setting fire to it in 1095 in the Crusades, setting it on fire and then parading round it singing, Christ, we adore thee, didn't really cut the mustard on, on bringing them to the faith, did it? They will go home and they will see him. And the harvest will be big. All the people listened attentively. He was on a platform. You can't do it here, but in a synagogue, the, the Torah will be in an ark behind. We try, we're trying to trying our best, but the Torah will be behind. And then there'll be a table where the word's read, the Torah, and then the beamer down low on the same level. Because I'm no different to anybody else. There's no, there's no difference in clergy and laity, that, that's nonsense. But it's, it's got to be a, bit, a little bit elevated to make it, he was making it easier for everybody to hear. No microphones then. He opens the scroll and the people rose in reverence because the word of God is precious. That's why. And the teaching of the word. There's got to be a distinction in the sacred to the familiar. And that's right and it's proper. Because people have died for God's word. People are dying for it now. So, Ezra the Torah teacher stood on a wooden platform which he had made for the purpose. Ezra opened the scroll where all the people could see him because he was higher. When he opened it, all the people rose to their feet and they read clearly from the scroll in the Torah of God, translated it and enabled them to understand the sense of what, being, what was being read. He blesses it to Adonai. His first priority is to minister unto the Lord. The great God and all the people said, Amen. The truth has become true. That's what our main means. Adonai is great. Lifted the hands. That's not something Happy Clap is invented. He did it back then too. Because you're surrendering all to Adonai. You're saying, Father, I'm yours. Bowing your head, falling prostrate. That's where you should be at. There's nothing wrong with that. Faces to the ground. It's right.
but he read it and he translated it and enabled them to understand what was being read. So what he's doing is teaching the Bible with expository teaching. Exposing the scripture and explaining it properly. That's the, the right biblical model. There's a quote from Donald Campbell. He wrote a book about Nehemiah. He says, Ezra and his helpers were the first in a long line of expository preachers who explained the Bible. This method of preaching has been blessed by God down through the centuries. It continues to be an effective instrument for bringing believers to spiritual maturity. Topical preaching may often be inspiring and helpful, but the spiritual benefits do not compare with those resulting from a preaching ministry like Ezra's. Blessed indeed are the believers who are privileged to sit under expository preaching. That's what we try and do. That's what we're trying to do. That's the way I was taught. That's what we try and do. Wherever there's a Beth Yeshua. So he's using the word as a chauffeur to bring the people back because it's a double-edged sword and it cuts like a knife. It cuts right through the darkness. And when the word of God is infused with the spirit, that's when you get the fireworks. And you can see what happened when he did. Nehemiah, the Tershata, means governor. Ezra the Kohen, the priest, and Torah teacher, the Levim, the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, today is consecrated to Adonai God, don't be mournful, don't weep. For all the people had been weeping when they heard the words of the Torah. So it's consecrated unto God. He's telling them not to be mournful and weeping because they obviously were because they've heard the word and they've been convicted by it because they know they've not been close to the Lord. They've just come back from exile. They've obviously not been close and they've come to the Lord, not to the land. And Nehemiah's getting the word read and they're realizing, they're hearing the shofar. And they're hearing the word corporately today on Yom Teruah. And the people are realizing and they're looking at themselves and they're thinking, yeah, I think I've got to change a couple of things. Maybe I'm not as close as I thought. And it's okay. Because really, who's arrived? Everybody falls short, don't they? But we can all do a bit more. We can all improve. What did Paul say in Romans? Oh, wretched man am I. Somebody's at the door. And if Paul can say it with a stellar record like his, so should we. Where do we get off? Like Shaul, we all have battles to fight. We don't win them all. Because we haven't arrived. But they wept when they heard the Torah and they repented when the kingdom of God came near. Like Yeshua said, repent. The kingdom of God's near. Make Teshuva. They heard the shofar. They're coming back to God, repenting, getting ready. The atonement's on its way. And then when the atonement comes, they come back to Adonai and they feel the atonement of God, the forgiveness, the releasing of the guilt, it's gone. The embarrassment, gone. And then they get to celebrate on Sukkot because now they're tabernacling with him again. That makes sense. 
Now they're in the presence of God. It's up and it's tabernacles amongst them. They're together as one. And then it's party time, celebrating. Not just to keep the feast. What's the point in keeping the feast if the feast doesn't keep you? Today includes Shabbat included. There's a time to feast and a time to fast. We will be fasting on Yom Kippur. And we will be here on the 28th. And Nehemiah said to him at this point, don't weep. Don't weep. You've been weeping too long. I think I might have missed, this, I might have missed a, a, um, a slide. But he said, go and don't stop crying. Go and eat some rich food. Sweet drinks. What do you suppose they were? Ribena. Go and have a party. But don't forget those who can't provide for themselves. Remember them. Zadukka charity. There's a Hebrew word, it's a Jewish word, it's Zadukka. And it literally means charity. But the root of it is Zadik, righteousness. One who is righteous. So if you're righteous, You give. That's the heart of God, isn't it? Walk humbly, love justice and mercy. Take care of the poor, the widow, the orphan. That's the menorah charity's heart. That's why we support them. So consecrated unto the Lord today because it's Yom Teruah. Don't be sad because the joy of the Lord is your strength. Everybody says it, but nobody knows what it means. The joy of the Lord's my strength. What? Joy. Joy, 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 joy. Chada. Kedvar, I'm sorry. Gladness. Right? Joy, the operative word. Gladness, happiness. So we should be glad and happy. Fair? If you've got joy. But like every Hebrew word, it's got a root. And the root word is chada, which is joined. So what's God saying? He's saying, I blow the shofar. I read the word. You get convicted and repent. You've turned to me. And that makes me happy. Because now we're back together. We're joined. We're joined together. So be happy. Because I'm happy. And when daddy's happy, you're strong. Because I've got you in my arms. That's what he means. Yeshua came to join us to the Father. So we can have a heavenly Father. We can call the creator, the sustainer of the universe, Daddy. There are times when you get out of fellowship with him. Not relationship, fellowship, different. You might be out of fellowship with him, but he's still your dad, isn't he? He's still your real you still got that relationship. And even when you go back to the pig pen and you're not in fellowship at that point. But a Rosh Hashanah is a time to come back home and make the joy of the Lord your strength. And when Daddy's happy, everybody's happy. And let's tie the old with the new, because we always do. Luke 3. Yeshua was about 30 years old when he began his public ministry. 
which means his birthday was close, right? It's fair to assume. And I can show you through the narrative of Luke, he was born on tabernacles. That's a whole another study. But tabernacles is the 15th. 15 is 14 days from now. So if, if your birthday's in 15 days from 14 days from now, you'd say, well, you're almost 30, wouldn't you? You wouldn't say if it was six months down, you'd say a couple of weeks off, you'd say, yeah, I'm almost 30, wouldn't you? Fair? No? It's very possible, that, you know, it was the first of Tishrei when he came along and started his public ministry a couple of weeks out from his birthday and said, repent, because the kingdom of God's near. Isn't it? Blowing his shofar and saying, from that time on, Yeshua began proclaiming, turn from your sins to God. Repent, for the kingdom of God is <laughs> right in front of you. It's here. Turn from your sins, turn to God, being a shofar. As the king of that kingdom, he's extending his hand at that point and he's saying, I love you, will you marry me? Be joined to the Father because he sent me, because he's sad that you're not connected to him. You miss your kids when they're not home, don't you? When you're not around, the, you're not all around the table together. You miss them. Daddy misses you too, because you're not complete. But when you're back together, it's like it breathes life back into you, isn't it? And it restores you. And when you come back to God. He's restored. It makes him happy. He cares that much. Breaks his heart when you're away. Why? Because we're vulnerable to the enemy. And the enemy will just chew you up, give an half a chance, he'll spit on you, and then he'll just kick the snot out of you every time. Won't he? And that's not for God's children. So he gives us these things in his love. So there shouldn't be any legalism involved in the feast. These things are... It has to be taught in his spirit, the spirit of God, the spirit of love. And if you don't, it's dead as a doornail. It's just dead. It's just dead religion, a form of religion with no power. You've got no love, you've got no God in it. The kingdom of God is near or at hand. Where is that? In Idzo. To join one thing to another, to come near, to approach. To bring near. So, how does God in heaven, whose spirit, Join with man on earth, who's flesh? Well, you see that? Messianic symbol? You got the menorah? You got the fish, right? Now, connected through the Star of David, who is the Messiah, right? The fish pointing to earth points to us, man, fishers of men. The menorah in the old and in the new symbolizes spiritual perfection. The seven spirits of God, spiritual perfection. It represents God. And what connects them together is the star that is Yeshua. 
That's why I love that symbol. That's been found on floors, it's been found on pottery, on walls. It really was the first century symbol of faith. All over the place. And he came to connect us back to the Father. So the kingdom's close at hand. Today, and it's as close as it was back then because Yeshua is blowing the shofar today. And he's still asking the same question. Where are you, man? Where are you? Shaul, Paul, you wrote to the Thessalonians. You loved them. You only spent three Shabbats with them. And he wrote to them about the end days. Because they were, really they were getting hammered and he was trying to put some courage in. And um, he wrote this. Brothers, we want you to know the truth about those who have died. Otherwise, you might become sad the way other people do. You have nothing to hope for. For since we believe that Yeshua died and rose again, we also believe that in the same way God through Yeshua will take with him those who have died. When we say this, we base it on the Lord's own word. We who remain alive when the Lord comes will certainly not take precedence over those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a rousing cry, with a call from one of the ruling angels, and with God so far. Those who died united with the Messiah will be the first to rise. Then we who are left, still alive, will be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus we will always be with the Lord. So he's putting encouragement in. Well, this is the reality that the kingdom is coming on earth as it is in heaven. Those who died... Those who are alive don't take precedence over those who've died. So who's the more fortunate? Paul said, to die is gain, didn't he? And you'll always be with the Lord. So hear the shofar and repent and come back to him. Yom, Yom Teruah, Yom Kippur and Sukkot. After Sukkot, the thousand years, the millennial reign, then you'll see the new heavens, the new earth, no more tears, no more sadness, no more illness, no more Daniel Andrews, no more fear. <laughs> no more death. I can't, I can't help myself. I'm gonna, I'll just bite myself too. <laughs> um... Then the Father comes. The Shekinah, his glory, lights up everything. Then we have complete peace. That's the final Shabbat. That's why you've got all the feasts in Leviticus 23, and it starts with Shabbat. So we'll leave you with the encouragement that Shaul said, let's encourage each other with these words, eh? Because that's what today is all about. Hear that show far. Turn. Yom Teru, hear the show far. Turn. Yom Kippur. And get back to God. So cope, tabernacle with him. Amen. Amen. We'll say Shana Tova, we'll say Hag Sameach, and we'll say Shabbat Shalom and Amen. If you want to stand, we'll have a a blessing and have a party. Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he give you what the world never ever will. His peace, he is the Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace himself. 
Shalom. Shabbat shalom, lovely people.